I'd like to talk to you today about how peculiar are you? <laughs> Turning your Bible to Exodus chapter 19. King James Bible, of course, no other. If you're a Bible believer, I'm sure you've uh, already experienced the thing of being rather peculiar, but uh, the question is how peculiar? Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. In the third month, when the children of Israel were go gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and their Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell, to the, uh, ch tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. It's not just peculiar people, it's a peculiar treasure. Hmm. You say, well, but that's Israel. That's ancient Israel, right? 1 Peter chapter 2. Is there anything in the New Testament that's, that says that we should be peculiar? 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn back to the New Testament. Or turn to the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1 through 10. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. I believe that's speaking about the Jewish people. There's a lot of them that stumble at Jesus Christ being their Messiah. They don't get it. Verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. So it's talking about Israel back in the Old Testament. We'll see about that. A peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in, times pa in time past were not a people, talking to Gentiles in other words, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So there you have a New Testament reference where Peter is writing both to Jews and Gentiles, and he says that we are supposed to be a peculiar people, a holy nation. So there you have it. Yes, it does apply to us today. I'll give you an even better verse. Go to Titus chapter 2. To the Pauline epistles. Are we supposed to be peculiar? Absolutely. And if you live by the King James Bible, it, you really don't have to try. It just will come naturally. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. We'll start there. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify him to, unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority authority let no man despise thee hmm very clearly written to gentiles so you have old testament peculiar people in the book of exodus new testament 
in what Peter's writing, both to Jew and Gentile, and then here you have completely to Gentile. If you're saved, you're called to be peculiar to the lost world. They're supposed to be there, some kind of a thing where they go, that, that people are kind of weird. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to, uh, we're not supposed to get along. But uh, notice what is the big point there about being peculiar. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar, peculiar people zealous of good works. The Gnostic professing Christians out there that just say it's mental cons consent to facts that you read in the Bible and then there's no change in the life that happens after that. And, you know, you can't judge anybody according to what they're doing and their works and whatever else. It's all just profession of faith and that's all that the more you can judge people. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. When you truly get saved, the Lord is going to purify you and he's going to make some good works happen through you. That's the whole point of him saving you. All right, but let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 14. We'll see a few more things about peculiar here. Deuteronomy 14, back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 14, beginning in verse 1. Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Uh, we're not supposed to do certain things like that there. Um, you know, not to cut ourselves, uh, or make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. I guess, you know, kind of shave right there. But look at verse 3. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. Now, if you read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, that's undone. So you don't have to, you know, well, there's, you know, clean and unclean meats. That's for the Jews back here in the book of Leviticus primarily. That's not for us today as Christians. So watch out for that. Uh, anybody comes along and says, you know, starts trying to put diet stuff down on you and whatever else, this is the types of things that you're supposed to eat according to the Bible cross them off um, in terms of, uh, you know, you can't eat certain types of meat, say it that way. Obviously, there's some good sense there to natural health eating. Uh, don't eat a bunch of junk food and fast food and all their other stuff. It's not, shouldn't even really be called food, <laughs> that stuff there. But if somebody wants to eat veg vegetables, uh, vegetarian type of diet, fine. Somebody wants to be a carn carnivorous type of diet, whatever, where you rarely ever eat any kind of fruit or vegetables, well, fine there too. Um, you just have to be careful with some of that stuff, go too far either way. You know, the best thing is to eat a combination of both. God made both, you should eat both. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 16 through 19. This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that, and that thou shouldst keep all his commandments, uh, and to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise, and in name, and in honor, and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God as he hath spoken. So there's holiness that comes into the thing. Like I said, you're not going to be very holy if you're not turning from sin. I didn't say you can become sinlessly perfect. Jesus Christ is the only one that ever could do that. Please understand that. I've never preached sinless perfection. A lot of the liars out there will say that about me. It's not true. I've never preached that. And of course, if they say that about me, say, okay, show me the video where he says you can be some sinlessly perfect. In context, I want to see it. Name of the video and timestamp. Show it to me. And if you can't show it, then you're a liar. Okay? So, that's part one of this study. Part two of this study is, I'm going to show you seven guaranteed ways, things that you can do, in other words, I'll say it that way, that will make you peculiar in the eyes of the world. Turn to Romans chapter 12. First and foremost, the best way I've ever found of becoming very peculiar in the eyes of the world 
is nonconformity. I have a whole study on nonconformity and the purpose of it and everything else. Very important thing. But let's go here to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, peculiar people, holy nation, you know, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable when God saves you, you're supposed to do service to him. You're supposed to say, okay, you saved me. You paid for my sins on the cross. Now I'm going to do things that are reasonable, like giving you my life sacrificing my time, sacrificing my dreams and whatever else. Um, I was not wanting to be a preacher growing up. Okay, there might have been a few little things there just to impress my Sunday school teacher or something, you know. Um, but I wanted to be a, I wanted to race motorcycles. Um, and then later on I wanted to be a wood turner. Um, my preaching really wasn't my thing. And then I got saved and I continued on with my dreams and after a while it was sort of Okay, I think the Lord's calling me to do some preaching, and that's why I'm here. It's my reasonable service to offer my body as a living sacrifice to God. But verse 2 is a really important one. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you're conforming to the Bible and what God wants you to do, you won't be conforming to the world. And you'll be different. And you will be peculiar. And how many of you, when you got saved, genuinely born again, all of a sudden your friends are saying, you're into what now? What are you doing with your time? You're reading a 400-year-old book. Oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah, uh, cool. Uh, I think. Um, and all of a sudden they start looking you at you as you're kind of peculiar. And the fun guy or girl you used to be, all of a sudden you're going around saying, no, I don't do that anymore. What? You used to love doing that. Yeah, I know, but I don't do it anymore. I'm a Christian now. I don't smoke that anymore. No, I don't drink that anymore. No, I don't do that. No, I, I don't watch that stuff anymore. No, you know what? That music's offensive to me now. I don't, you know. What happened to them? Oh, they're part of some cult or something like this. See, the thing that's weird about this whole deal is modern professing Christianity, they're not real Christians, but modern professing Christianity actually tries to make themselves more popular with the lost world. Hey, look at me. I look just like you. I have cool music like you do. We have a cool place we go to called church with the unchurched. We're all unchurched. So we came and we made our own cool church. We don't, you, you know, Read Bibles that say, Beholdeth and things like that. We want our modern versions that sound just like street language and, and that look shiny and glossy, not this old black, you know, with leather with the gold gilt. No, that's, you know, we don't want that stuff. Hmm. They are conformed to the world. Why? Because they are still the world. That's why. They're not peculiar. In fact, the average modern Christian, the thing that they fear the most is being peculiar. They want to look like the crowd. They want to be popular. Peculiar? <laughs> oh my, no. Number two, the second way that you can become peculiar is to have clean speech. Matthew chapter 26. The book of Matthew chapter 26. If you're familiar with this story of Peter denying the Lord, an interesting thing happens here. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 through 75. It says here, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Gal Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Not because he was scared, but because he was mad at the Lord. And you'll see that here in just a couple minutes. Verse 71. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were, with the, that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath. <laughs> Getting really good here, you know. I do not know the man. <laughs> you know, with an oath, actually. He said an oath that time. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. 
you don't talk like the rest of us. You talk like one of them blankety blank religious people. Are you kind of some kind of little goody two shoes there, little blankety blank? You're one of those little blah, 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 and they start coming out with all the language. Hmm. You know, I've been around lost people. And I just literally, I walk into a room and they'll stop swearing. And they don't know who I am. They don't know I'm a preacher. And especially if I say, you know, hey, I'm a preacher or whatever. Oh, oh. Mm, mm, mm. Why do they do that? It's very rare I ever have to tell anybody, hey, watch your language, please. Most times they do it automatically. Why? Huh. I remember being a younger man at one point in time, sold a vehicle to an older guy, and, and, um, and he said to me, he said, you know, I just want to commend you, young man. He said, I work in construction. And he said, those young men just have such filthy mouths. And this guy wasn't even a Christian, by the way. He said, those young guys, he said, they have such filthy mouths. He said, it just it's, it gets a little old after a while. But he said, uh, you have really good speech. And he said, I appreciate that. A young man, man that's well-spoken. And I said, well, thank you, sir, you know, very much. That's a great honor to me. Hmm. There's something about speech there. You get somebody that just cusses up a blue storm, they're, you don't really think of them as being a really good Christian. Verse 74, what did Peter do to prove that he was not one of Jesus' disciples? Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And we, he went out and wept bitterly. I bet Peter cleaned up his language after that. You see, actually, if you just study, study this whole thing dispensationally, Peter wasn't saved at that point in time. He was one of Jesus' disciples, but there was no, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. So, you know, perfect salvation had not, you know, was not there, was not available to Peter. So, you know, Jesus, that's why Jesus says to Peter at one point in time, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Uh, Peter was not converted as one of the disciples here in the gospel accounts. He wasn't there. Later on, he got saved. And I'm sure his speech cleaned up at that point in time. I mean, why is it, I, this always confused me, when you have people that profess to be Christians and yet they use all sorts of dirty language. Are there times and places where it's wrong for you to swear? You say, oh well, yeah, if there's women, you know, and, and little children around. Why? If there's nothing wrong with swearing and cussing. See, real men don't cuss. It's cowards that have to use profanity. Have you seen some of the guys that swear, Brian? You wouldn't say that to them. They're cowards. They're scared. I've seen guys that are a foot or two taller than me, you know, Guys that are approaching, you know, six foot eight, six foot nine, somewhere in there or something, or even seven foot tall, huge big guys that could beat anybody up and they have to use profanity all the time. You know why? Because they're scared. They're sissies. That's why. A real man has character. A real man guards his speech. Read about that in the book of James. Getting control over your tongue. And why was Peter, why did Peter cuss and swear there? Curse and swear. Why? because they were trying to make him out to be a Christian or religious, we'll say it that way. Oh, you're one of Jesus' disciples. Oh, look at you and your clean speech. Oh, you think so, do you? Well, here, how about this? Bleep, bleep, bleep. Out it came. But you see, if you want to be a peculiar, part of the peculiar people, a holy nation, holy people, then uh, you clean up your speech and you should go places and people should not have to cover their children's ears around you. And I realize that there's so many people that are just so wicked nowadays that you know a lot of them don't even notice it, or whatever else, but that doesn't matter. You don't ever gauge your morality by what's going on out in the world. You gauge your morality by a book. Jesus didn't swear. There's no guile found in Jesus' mouth. None. Then why would you swear? Well, he's God. He's perfect. So, you know... So what? Couldn't he give us an example to live by? I mean, is it that difficult for people to just say, hey, you know what, not using profanity anymore. You want to be peculiar? 
Do you want to be a treasure in God's sight? You want God to look down and say, right there, there's that cesspool down there on the earth, but right there is one of my, one of my jewels. That man, that woman right there. They don't conform to the world and they don't cuss. They have a clean mouth. They're holy. How about number three? Be honest. There's a good one. First Timothy chapter two. I'm giving you the advice that you need to hear as things get worse in this world. Um, there's going to be a call for righteousness. Um, as you have people get becoming just off the charts, mentally ill is now, you know, accepted and whatever else, and it, oh, it's the new norm. No, it's not. No, it is not. Don't ever think that this all this weird, gender inclusive, binary, liberal left, satanic junk. It's not the new normal. It's now. It's not what's now accepted. It's an attack, and we have to fight back against that. We have to say, you know, yes, I know that this stuff is prophesied. Okay, but the Bible says, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Let, in the context there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's talking about hindering, slowing things down, stopping things. Yes, we do have to fight. We have to fight and say, no, I'm not going to be part of this. Hey, well, things are getting worse and worse, so you can't, you're just fighting a losing battle. No, I'm not, because I know what the Bible says. I'm supposed to hinder this whole system. I'm not okay with this stuff. This liberal left agenda and whatever else, it's wrong. It's wicked. It's satanic. But let's continue here about being honest. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, hmm, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. You know, it's a good thing to be honest. Honesty is the best policy, the old saying goes. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a reputation for being honest? I hope you do if you're saved. People that you're around, they should know, hey, you know, they're peculiar, they're a little weird, but you know what? They're honest. They won't lie to me. They won't deceive me. They're not trying to steal from me or or whatever con me into doing something or whatever else that person's honest they have clean speech they're not like everybody else they don't conform to the world they have clean speech and they're honest boy that's peculiar it's a good thing first timothy chapter 2 verse 9 and 10 the next one would be modest apparel first timothy chapter 2 verse 9 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Which becometh women professing uh, godliness with good works. Women are supposed to adorn themselves modestly. And here we are basically over a hundred years now. Uh, the women's suffrage movement came in in the early 1900s here in America, and most other countries followed suit or maybe even were a little bit ahead of America. And women started to cut their hair short, and they started to wear pants. And that's when the word transvestite was invented. Transvestite means taking the vesture, the clothing, from, one, you know, from men and putting it over on women. Women didn't wear pants in the 1800s or in the 1700s, or in the 1600s, or the 1500s. They didn't do that. Um, it, well, I just, uh, I can find, maybe I'll look for one and I can find some, to, you know, the exception to overthrow the rule. Um, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I'm talking about historical facts. Religious beliefs aside and whatever else, the historical facts are women wore dresses and skirts for thousands of years. Show me any, any ancient culture where, where the women wore pants. They didn't. All of a sudden, oh, we're you know, just as good as men, and that was the whole women's suffrage thing. We want to vote. We want to be in political office. We want to, all the rights of men. We're just the same as men. Um, no, you're not. Okay? Uh, two things that are different, things that are different are not the same. Uh, men and women are supposed to be different. 
There's beauty in that. There's good things in that. There are some things that women excel at. And I'm not going to say, well, I'm just as good as a woman. <laughs> Why would I say that? Women, a truly feminine, beautiful lady, has power. You want power over men? I've seen my wife have power over men. I've seen it. She doesn't even have to say anything. I can't tell you how many times we've been at a store or something and she's ever looking at some things over in the grocery aisle over near the fresh produce or something. We were in the one time she had her one beautiful dress on and, and this older man comes up and he says, excuse me, ma'am. And she turns around and she says, oh yes. And he said, uh, I just wanted to say you look absolutely beautiful today. He said, it's nice to see a lady out, out and about. And she, she smiled and said, well, thank you very much. You know, that's, that's really honored to, to have you say that. And he said, yeah, he said, just, wow. He said, you really look beautiful today. She's had older women. I remember there was an old woman the one time sitting there and she had a dress on and my mother walked up and or my, uh, yeah, my wife walked up and this older woman, she says to her, she says, oh, young lady, she said, you look beautiful today. Just wanted to tell you that. At an art gallery the one time and the woman that owned the place comes walking up to my wife and she said, you look just like you're out of a fairy tale book, just like a, a queen walking around. She said, you're absolutely breathtaking. Another time I remember, uh, I've told this story before, at this grocery store and, and uh, you know, my wife is going to get in her side of the vehicle and an older man walks away from his wife, runs over and opens the door for my wife and says, here, let, please let me. <laughs> and he shuts the door for my wife and goes and hops in his vehicle and his wife had to get in by herself. I'm sure that made for an interesting conversation on the way home. But um, women, oh, I want power. I want power. Well, then be a lady and get the power that God can give you through that. Have long hair, long dresses. Look beautiful when you go out. What's wrong with that? Oh, that's demeaning. How is it demeaning? It just amazes me. But the whole thing is, a woman is to dress herself in modest apparel. Why? For what purpose? so that you're not causing men to lust. Well, if that's true for a woman, couldn't it also be somewhat said of a man? Well, you say, well, the Bible doesn't openly... I, I get that. But why would a man want to dress in a way that's provocative to women? If you're a guy that has a, you know, strong arms and whatever else, what are you doing putting a muscle shirt on? You trying to elicit lust? Well, I'm just going to put my jogging shorts on and walk into the store and everything. You could elicit lust with that. You want to be peculiar? I'm not saying we have to wear religious uniforms or anything like that. God forbid, that's certainly not in Scripture. Uh, but you should look a little bit different than the rest of the lost world. You know, I used to have a Harley Davidson T-shirt that I found at Goodwill or something like that. I thought, oh, it fits me, you know, and I used to wear it. And I thought, yeah, I really don't want to be associated with a lot of the guys that ride Harley Davidson motorcycles. So I stopped wearing it, got rid of it. Different times I'd wear t-shirts and things. I used to have a Ruger t-shirt that I would wear occasionally when I'm doing a video and people said, you know, the Ruger, you know, symbol is a, is a phoenix, you know, with its wings up like this. And they said, not really one of the best things to do there, Brother Brian. And you're kind of associating with some satanic symbolism. And I, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Stop wearing it. Think about what you're wearing. What is it saying to people? Dress in a way that makes sense. Everything I have on right now is cotton. I don't wear synthetic clothes or anything like that. But I need to be careful with what I'm wearing. Peculiar, you see. Here's a really good one. Number five thing I have written down here. You want to turn your Bible to Luke chapter 9. And I've done this one. If you ever want to have an experiment where you want uh, most people to leave you alone, <laughs> this is a good one. Um, carry your Bible with you in public. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 26. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose his, himself or be cast away? 
For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory, in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. Um, this book right here, this King James Bible, there's a lot of people out there that profess to be Christians, and yet they'll make fun of this book. I've seen it. Obviously, I've seen it. I've had it happen to me for many years now, people attacking me because of my stands for the King James Bible. Um, I'm never going to be ashamed of this book. In fact, I'm going to be preaching even hard, more hardcore things that this book is God's pure, preserved, inspired, inerrant word. I firmly believe it is. This is no normal book. This is a supernatural book. And if you think that you're going to make me ashamed of that statement, you're going to be waiting a very long time before that happens, let me tell you. But um, two experiences, I will say, from my many years of being a Bible believer. Um, I remember one time I was going out door to door with a Baptist church I used to attend, you know, knocking doors to fill up the church building. And uh, I remember we were walking, myself and another brother were walking along, and we had our Bibles, and we were talking about the Bible and about the Lord and whatever, and just walking down this street in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And um, I see, I look up and I see this guy is walking towards us, and he, you know, he was looking off to the side or something, not paying attention. And I saw, you know, he's kind of walking like this, and I see, and he goes like this, and he looks at us, and just stops dead in his tracks, and, and looks down, and he he looked at us, and then down towards our Bibles, and went like this, and turned and across the street, <laughs> crossed over to the street, and then got on the other side, and he's going down the other side like this, you know, walking, you know, so he doesn't have to look at the horrible black books in our hands. Um, that was one of my experiences. Another time. Um, when my wife and I got married, her parents flew in from Iowa to Pennsylvania, where we were at at the time. And uh, we had to go there and wait to pick them up from the airport. So I um, took my Bible. Normal. Went in, we're sitting there in the airport, you know, in the area where you can go and get food to eat and whatever else. And, um, and I'm sitting there. You know, my wife and I, and I was reading some passages from the Bible, and we were just talking about, you know, um, she wasn't saved that long, so I was showing her some scriptures. She was asking questions, you know, what does the Bible teach about this and that? Well, let me show you. I mean, going over here to the, this passage and that passage, and I'm talking about it, and I see this woman working over at the McDonald's stand there, and there was, you know, a couple other food, it was like a food court thing. They said they had McDonald's, and then they had Subway or some other couple different things that you could eat there. And uh, this woman, I see her, and she's, she's just going like this, looking over us. And then I saw she goes back, you know, kind of into the back, and she gets on the phone, and she's doing this kind of, you know, looking out our way. And, and I'm thinking, what in the world's going on here? And about this time, this, uh, or I shouldn't say, a few minutes later, say it that way, this goony guy comes over, and he's got, you know, this high and tight haircut, you know, and military haircut. And he comes over, and he's, he's standing there, you know, uh, like this, and he's, you know, goony guy, and he's over there, you know, about 12 feet away from our table, and he's looking over kind of with this look of, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, are you planning some violence? Uh, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have brought the sword of the spirit in, I guess, to this, you know, wicked airport, but, you know, I just like, kind of looked over at the guy, just sort of a, you know, go ahead, come over and talk to me, you know, please do, you know, but he's just standing there, you know, I'll keep an eye on these horrible people with their Bible. <laughs> uh, and that was years ago. I mean, we're talking, what, 2012? You know, now I don't know what would happen. Uh, but should be actually entertaining. But I stay away from airports right now. But um, just carry the Bible. Carry your Bible with you. And uh, people, you'll see people will act like it's some kind of a, you know, coiled rattlesnake or something. I mean... It's crazy. I remember a brother years ago, he was out uh, on a bike trail outside of New York City, bicycle trail, and he was out there trying to pass out tracks. And I remember the one guy's riding towards him, and, and the guy says, hi, how you doing? And the guy on the bicycle, he looks and he smiles, and he goes, oh, hi. And, and the guy says, here, I have something for you to read. And the guy looks down at it, and he goes, ah, ah, like this, and he, he pulls his arms back, like, you know, he's, he kind of, oh, yeah, ah, ah. <laughs> it's a gospel tract. You know, mighty peculiar.
that's the point. Number six, eat a healthy diet. That'll make you rather peculiar. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Hey, do you mind if I swing by a McDonald's, get something to eat? I'll get you something to eat too. No, thank you. I don't touch it. Oh, not a big fan of McDonald's. No, I don't eat fast food. Oh, hey, like a beer? I can get, I'm getting one for myself. Do you want a beer? I don't drink. Okay. <laughs> hey, here's some candy. Want some candy? No, no, I don't touch the stuff. No, thank you. Not real good for my health. Yeah, there's nothing sinful about eating a gummy bear or something. You know, thou shalt not eat gummy bears or something in the New Testament. But it's understanding the concepts of this body. Here is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to defile it. Eating a bunch of, you know, coal tar dyes laced with sugar and high fructose corn syrup and everything and other little chemicals to make a gummy bear. It's not really going to help me as a Christian. So, eh, eh, you know. And you'll get there. I mean, you say, well, I, I eat that stuff, brother. Okay. But in the process of sanctification, you'll get to a point where you'll say, don't really need that stuff. I used to be a junk food addict, if you don't know that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I have to think about my own health, first and foremost. Then my wife, then my son, and ultimately even my little dog. Um, we have to think about health. But wouldn't it be something if I was here and I was saying about, you know, Oh, you need to get, you know, in good shape. You need to, you need to be out there, you know, eating the right kind of foods and everything. And, and I'm about, you know, this big or something. And, and uh, you know, I mean, that would be kind of a problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, I'm 46 years old. I'll be 47 this coming week. Um, and I'm in better shape in terms of, of, you know, lifting things and hiking and whatever else. I'm in really good shape right now, better shape than I was in my 20, you know, 20s because back then I was eating a lot of junk food and I was having all kinds of problems. But now, you know, uh, used to be when, you know, I'd get a, you know, my mother would send something for Easter or whatever and she'd send this junk food, you know, chocolate eggs or something with peanut butter inside or whatever, or, or here's some, uh, little marshmallow peeps or something. I, please don't send that stuff anymore. I don't eat that anymore. What? You used to love that stuff. Yeah, used to love that stuff. I don't anymore. I don't want that stuff. Please don't send it. What can I send you? Well, I really don't eat candy. Huh? You don't eat candy anymore? That's peculiar. Uh-huh. Another good way to become peculiar. But the best one of all I saved for last. Number seven. First of all, we have nonconformity. Second, we have clean up your speech, clean speech. Number three, be honest. Number four, dress modestly. Number five, carry your Bible with you out in public. Number six, and you don't have to carry a huge one. I mean, you can just a little pocket Bible or something like that too. Number six, eat a healthy diet. Number seven, you can start turning to Ephesians chapter 5. My advice to you, which you're not going to get probably from any other pastor out there, any other preacher out there, I should say, um, I think you should speak to yourself. What? <laughs> yeah. Did he just say speak to himself? Yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> start speaking to yourself. Uh, if all the other ones fail, that one will work, I promise you. Start talking to yourself and say, he's talking to himself again. You say, why did you do that? That was really stupid. Yeah, I don't know. I shouldn't have done that. That was a really dumb thing to do. <laughs> Be careful around, you know, who you do it around. You might end up in some kind of psychiatric evaluation. But <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Speaking to yourselves 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, two different things there. Speaking to yourself and singing. Okay, that's what it says there. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. But you're supposed to speak to yourself. The Trinitarians come up with one of their brilliant, you know, quote-unquote brilliant attacks on the Godhead doctrine, and they say, was Jesus speaking to himself? You know, when he, when he was the Father and Jesus are speaking, or if the Father and Jesus are one and the same being, they're the same God there, um, you know, uh, was he speaking to himself? Yes, he was. Because we're supposed to speak to ourselves. Uh, you get saved for a little while and you start to know when your flesh is starting to act up. And you have to start saying to yourself, stop that. Don't do that. Or you go to, you know, give in to some sin and you go, stupid, why would you do that? Don't do that. That was wrong. You know better than this, Brian. What are you, what are you doing? Stop it. Well, somebody overhears that, they're going to think you're rather peculiar. And that's a good thing. So, not a real super detailed study, but just something I'd like to exhort all of you on. Um, people have this weird mentality nowadays that I can be saved and somehow not peculiar. I can be saved and I can look like the world and be accepted by the world and whatever else. And the world can do good things that lines up with my feelings and my beliefs. This whole Roe versus Wade thing. Oh, it's been overturn overturned and oh, how wonderful. And I think, you know, things are getting better and the blessing of God is coming upon our nation. Uh, no, you have to actually look past that, like I was saying in my video. Um, you have to look past it and say, no, this isn't all of a sudden. I mean, why would God wait till now when the nation's falling apart to bless us? <laughs> you know, hey, you've been doing such a good job of becoming more and more filthy as time goes by, so I'm going to bless you by stopping abortion. No, there's another agenda there, probably several other agendas there that the devil has for stopping abortion. Okay, and um, of course it's not really going to stop. It'll still be available in certain states in America. It's just dividing up the country is all that it's doing. Um, Catholics can't stop evil. They only can create it. Uh, they, you know, it's Catholic fighting of evil is kind of like the little whack-a-mole thing, you know. Little mole sticks his head up, the Catholic goes boink there, and another one goes boink up there, and another one boink like this. Yeah, Catholics cannot stop evil. They never have been able to. Uh, Catholics come into a country, the country will start to have problems with prostitution and drugs and alcohol and, and gambling and, you know, all sorts of vice, all sorts of sin, in other words. Every Catholic-controlled country out there is falling apart, every single one of them. Uh, there's no such thing as a godly Catholic nation. It doesn't happen. Um, America was a godly nation because people that were here were first and foremost separatists, peculiar people. That's why America was a holy nation for a while. And the more Catholics came over here to America, um, the worse things got. It's a matter of historical record. You go back to the early you know, 1600s, things were pretty decent. And you get up into the 1700s, it was still pretty good. And then you start getting into the 1800s and whatever else, when more Catholics started to come in, especially when you get to the 20th century, America just went this down the toilet. More Catholics brought in more corruption. It's the way it is, because Catholicism is Satan's church. And I don't have to repent of one word of that. Jesus didn't found the Catholic Church. Satan did. It's the perfect counterfeit of the real true church. So, don't be afraid of being peculiar, brethren. Um, you should embrace it, actually. And you should say, what can I do today to distance myself from these lost people? Um, Heard it said the one time really well, if uh, the lost world, if, if they're in the quicksand, you don't jump into the quicksand to get them out of the quicksand. You stay on the dry bank and let them see what it means. We're Christians. We're different than the rest of these people out there. We don't have church buildings like the Catholics do and the Mormons do and the Jehovah's Witnesses and whatever else. Um, no, the New Testament doesn't teach church buildings. We don't mess with that stuff. We're different than that. We don't do tax exemption for our system. 
we don't go to the state to get permission, their permission for us to follow the Bible. Um, we're different. We're peculiar. And we have holy standards and righteous standards. And uh, if you're a Christian woman out there, wear a dress. Let your hair grow long. And uh, see the kind of reaction you get when you go out in public. Most of the time you'll get kind of a sort of a respectful stay away from her kind of a thing. I mean, I guess if you're in some really wicked area, they might try to yell at you or something like that. But uh, God will protect you. He will. He won't let you down. So please take heed to these things that I've said. It's very important. That's going to be it for this study, and we will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.